computer. I think we're good. So we're ready to go? Yep. Okay, well, I have my wife Becky here with me. We've been together for, by on April 8th, we'll be married 55 years. And so we've had quite the journey together. Uh, I have, um, I, I grew up in West Virginia and um, was in Illinois for seven years. And have, we have served with the navigators, as I'll mention later, for uh, over 50 years. I met the navigators in 1954. So um, the, the uh, topic that we're looking at this morning is uh, journey to walking with the poor. Um, I served with the navigators for a long time in the student ministry and a number of other places, but God gradually gave us uh, a tremendous heart for the poor and that's how we ended up here in Phoenix. Uh, let me uh, launch uh, first with a word of prayer and then um, I'll share a verse and then I'll walk you through our journey. Lord, we pray that your good hand will be on us this morning. We pray that we will cover the topics that we need to cover and uh, we will avoid those things that may be extraneous that are not relevant to what we uh, need to talk about for the benefit of your people. So we give you praise and thanks for that. And we ask you to lead us in Jesus name, amen. I launch with a verse, Psalm 146, seven to nine. Who executes justice for the oppressed? Who gives food to the hungry? The Lord sets the prisoner free. The Lord, open, the Lord opens his eyes to the blind. The Lord raises up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord protects the stranger. He supports the fatherless and the widow, but he thwarts the way of the wicked. Uh, there are over 3,000 verses in the scriptures that relate to the poor. And I didn't realize that until I was quite along in my journey in walking with the Lord. But God is concerned about the poor. That doesn't mean that he's not concerned about everyone. It doesn't mean that he saves the poor and ignores the others. He loves everyone and God loves the whole world. But at the same time, God always keeps his eye on those who are oppressed who, or who are suffering or who are economically deprived. And for that reason, uh, God started to stir my heart to, um, to lead us. Uh, let me see here, there we go. So let's go back to our journey with the Navigators. Becky and I both met the Navigators. I was at Marshall University in 1964. And uh, there's a little story here that uh, really, especially for you, Dan, will be familiar because you just shared earlier with me uh, how significant your time was with Jay Bratton. In 1964, I was a believer, very strong parents in the Lord, but I'd also observed a lot of hypocrisy in the body of Christ at large. I'd been involved with Youth for Christ very involved with my church. I had gone off to a Bible college. It was a very difficult experience. And the next year I transferred back to uh, Huntington, West Virginia at Marshall University. Some of you remember the movie, We Are Marshall. I had a friend who went down in that flight. And uh, so during that time, in, uh, I was struggling and I was invited to a meeting and I met a banker there. And I won't go through the details of the story, it's quite dramatic, but in the, the, the meeting of him, he determined that he would drive from Charleston, West Virginia to Huntington, West Virginia, every week to see me at two o'clock in the, in the afternoon. And every week he had something that was rich and exciting and new to share from the scriptures. 
he taught me all kinds of things and he especially taught me the value of ministering one-on-one -on -one. and that's what you mentioned dan and so uh at that point i got involved with the navigators and uh we were on a journey and that journey has never stopped uh since 1964. the navigators are known as probably some of you know for discipleship and spiritual multiplication the navigators are also very committed to the nations Right now, we have student ministries, military ministries, business and communi business community, churches, cities, and we're in over 100 nations with well over uh, 5,000 staff. There are two pictures here that I'm sharing with you. One is uh, our board picture that I mentioned to Frank is old. Right now, our board is much more diverse uh, ethnically and much younger. This picture is a couple years ago when uh, it was before COVID and uh, I was attending the board meeting and we took a picture of, of uh, our board. Now the front row is uh, in the center is the US director and then uh, I'm beside him. And uh, these are the emeritus members of the board, either the existing leaders or the emeritus members are, uh, in, the, in that picture in the back row is the board. The other picture that you see on the left is something that uh, I had the privilege of participating with others, but also uh, was uh, somewhat instrumental in moving uh, the navigators to launch a ministry among our urban poor. And this is one of what we call Navigators I-58 mission. And uh, so I just thought you might be interested in seeing that picture because right now we have um, uh, a number of ministries, including Chicago, by the way. We have both uh, in Chicago, I-58 and uh, Breaking Ground. And I um, actually, I think uh, South Park Church has had some involvement with, um, with uh, the ministry at Breaking Ground for uh, some years. How did we end up going from a ministry that was focused on students, business people, churches, most of our ministry through the years was focused on middle or upper income, uh, uh, upper income people and uh, some very wealthy people as well. And we didn't have a lot of focus on the poor. And uh, this was really, for me, quite a journey of all well over 20 years before we finally ended up moving to Phoenix in, uh, and joining an urban ministry. I, as I look back, the things that stirred my heart were very early on. Uh, my mother had a concern for the poor. Uh, actually, we were not that well off. In fact, in our early years, we were just uh, a little bit above the poverty line. But I had wonderful parents, a wonderful father and mother who uh, taught us to walk with the Lord. We were basically discipled as kids and my mother and dad through radio ministry. I can remember listening to Billy Graham, uh, the Lutheran Hour, uh, listening to uh, um, what was it, the old fashioned revival hour. I, all of those uh, we listened to back to the Bible. Every night my dad would have that on, uh, on our, um, our radio at, in the evenings. And uh, as children, we listened to all of those things. In 1964, after I met the Navigators, I was invited uh, the following year to go to a summer training program at the University of Maryland. Pro program didn't really have anything to do with the poor, but one day I was reading Dr. Kenneth Wiest's book on the fullness of the spirit. Dr. Kenneth Wiest was at Moody Bible uh, Institute at the time. And uh, the booklet was on, as I mentioned, uh, how to be full, full of the Holy Spirit or the fullness of the spirit. I don't know the connection to Luke 4, 18 and 19, but I do recall putting my head back on my pillow 
and saying to myself after I had read that passage on a Sunday afternoon or read the booklet, I thought to myself, I will never fully understand what the fullness of the Holy Spirit is about until I understand what Luke 4, 18 and 19 really means. That's when Jesus announced in Nazareth his ministry, and he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, and he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to free the prisoners, to give sight to the blind, to set the oppressed and free and proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. I didn't know what that meant, but I knew there was something significant. It's interesting through my years into the state of Illinois and on into Canada in leading for 14 years, that verse in Isaiah 61 kind of ran in the back of my mind. And I would constantly say to myself, what do those passages mean? But I would just keep on going, do, going on and doing what navigators do in all of those situations. Another very interesting thing happened, and that's the significance of South Park Church in my own life. At the time, Art Gay was the pastor. This is 1974 to 76. And we had moved to Chicago. And uh, we went to uh, South Park Church and uh, immediately we loved the church and we got involved and Art Gay and I became very great friends. Some of the people in this class and the old partners class and the ambassadors class were uh, in classes that I taught at the time. And uh, we had a wonderful time together and made friends during that time. But the thing that I remember most uh, was that was most important during my time at South Park Church was Art talking to me about driving down into the city and meeting with pastors and leaders who were doing urban ministry. And Art reflected a, a tenderness toward that. And there are two things that came out of that. One was Art was very involved with the National Association of Evangelicals, and a little bit later became the president of the National Association of Evangelicals, and this ongoing ministry of going down into the city and meeting with pastors who were in the urban context. Now, as a sidebar to that, let me just say that I have been encouraged with what South Park Church has done under Eric's leadership. Uh, the interesting thing is that South Park Church has always had a DNA of a commitment to world relief and other ministries to the poor and what is going on in the urban context and also a very strong commitment to the authority of scripture and to the centrality of Jesus Christ. And that overall emphasis had a profound impact on my life. And Art and I talked about this. I would come back to Chicago and visit and visit with Art and Joanne. And Becky and I would talk with them. I would meet with Art. And we would carry on all of these ongoing conversations about ministry, urban ministry, what was going on at South Park, and also what was going on among evangelicals in the nation as a whole. So it was quite an educational experience for me, not only at the church for those two years, but also right on through the 80s and into the 90s. And to this day, Art Gay and I are very, very good friends. We moved in 1976 to Canada, and I became the national director. And basically, we ministered to students, to churches, all the things I mentioned earlier. Not a whole lot of thought given to the poor until we had one experience that uh, turned my heart to the poor, and that was my wife, Becky, uh, who's right here beside me. She got in, involved with a, a lady who was um, seriously struggling, struggling with um, income, with uh, vulnerability, and she had two little boys, 
And through a series of circumstances, Becky started to drive her to, uh, to school and take the two little boys, especially on cold days, to school. And we got very involved with the family. She ended up with cancer. And uh, we ended up taking the boys in. And during that time, we kept the boys. She died. And then later, we were able to place the boys in a very, very fine multicultural home. But that started to alert us to the needs of the poor. Uh, it wasn't the key, but it was certainly something that was very important. And my heart started to turn. And I started to think more fully about Luke 4, 18 and 19. Then also, it was during this time that right at the end of our time where Becky and I started to really go through a period of difficult suffering with our families. Up to that time, with our family, up to that time, we had really uh, experienced the blessing of God. Everything we had touched from ministry uh, experiences had turned to gold. We were... Uh, experiencing blessing in every way we look, but now we were suffering and struggling and we were vulnerable. And we started to sense what it's like to be vulnerable and to feel shame and struggle. And as a result of that, I started to think more about Luke 4, 18 and 19 in a much deeper way. Then in 1990, I was asked to go to Asia. We I didn't actually live in Asia, but I had traveled to Asia from Canada and from Illinois for many, many years. And we were asked to take over the countries in Asia and serve as the Asia director. But my primary job was to develop the leaders and to bring them along. And uh, actually, all of those leaders are now either serving on the international team or they are serving in Asia. And so it was quite a good experience. But it was Matthew 6, 36 to 38. He felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. He said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are, the few, are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord of a harvest to send out workers into his harvest field. As I started to observe a, a, uh, our ministry in Asia, because we ministered among students, I observed that literally people were not downwardly mobile, they were upwardly mobile. And that we had been ministering for quite a few decades in Asia but we really were not touching Asia's poor. And I was thinking a lot about Jesus among the dispirited and the distressed. And I, I thought, well, now why are we not ministering among the dispirited and the distressed in Asia? And I was asking a lot of hard questions. And to some degree, it was rather uh, threatening to some of our leaders, but nevertheless, I was asking those questions. And then in 1993, <clears throat> I received a very, very clear call to minister among the poor. Now, I didn't know what that call meant, but it was certainly dramatic. I had asked the Asian leaders when I traveled to their countries if they would give me one day or a half day just to walk the streets. And so in this case, I was in Surabaya, Indonesia, Surabaya, Indonesia, and uh, I uh, left my hotel and walked down the street. And as I was maybe a mile or two down the road, and there was a shopping center, and I walked into that shopping center, and honestly, uh, you could have placed everything that is in Colorado Springs or in Chicago in a shopping center. There, there were Mercedes, all kinds of wealth. And uh, I looked at that and I thought, well, this is just a little bit of America and other Western countries here. But then as I was walking the streets away from that uh, particular shopping area, I observed 
things that I had not seen before. It was, I've often said to people, it was quite hot for me that day. And then I finally got back to the bridge that I had to cross to go to return to my hotel. And as I was crossing the bridge, I looked down on a stream or a small river where uh, people lived on both sides of the stream. And uh, the living conditions were very, very, very difficult. And then my eyes got trained on a woman in the middle of the stream. And she was bathing her little boy. She was sitting in a boat bathing her little boy. And I thought to myself, why is she bathing the little boy in the middle of the stream? And then it hit me. That's where the water is cleanest. And I thought to myself, wow, if I have ever seen the image of God, that's it. God created us in his own image. He gave us the capacity to love our children. And even in those conditions, here was this young woman who loved her little boy, and she was going to bathe that little boy in the cleanest water in a little boat. And I thought to myself, what would Jesus do? I thought he would certainly be able to speak the language. I couldn't. But I, I thought, well, he would go around. He would walk down to the side of the stream. And he would say, as we see in the New Testament and other instances, he would say, woman, come here. And he would share with her the good news. He would see the image of God in her and he would see her need for good news and he would share that and then he would put her in a situation where she could find her way into experiencing new life and eternal life in Jesus. Then my mind went to Isaiah 6, whom shall I send who will go for me? And I looked down at the stream and I reflected on what I had experienced. And I actually said to the Lord right there, Lord, here am I, send me. That was my call to the poor. I had no idea of what it meant. And in fact, it would be years before I fully knew what it meant. But I knew that wherever I went from that time on, I would have to give myself to caring for the poor. That would have to be a big part of my life. And so I returned, uh, Becky, I returned to the U.S. to join the U.S. leadership team. And then in 1997, uh, I became the U.S. director. And so now Becky and I were back in the U.S. and we were off and running and leading the U.S. work. But during this time, there were a number of things that happened because I wanted to use not only my uh, leadership to stimulate uh, our campus ministries and stimulate our ministries among business and professional people, churches and cities, but I wanted the navigators to take on a focus on the poor. And so in 2003, we took 120 of our leaders to New York City. And we identified a number of urban leaders that we could go to both in terms of pastors of color who led uh, mega churches and pastors and leaders who are ministering among the urban poor. And we use that time for these people to instruct us and teach us on what does it mean to give yourself to the city? What does it mean to give yourself in ministry to people of color? And what does it mean to give yourself to ministering among the urban poor? That was followed by taking our leadership team on a number of visits down to Jackson, Mississippi to learn from John Perkins. Some of you know John Perkins. He's written uh, uh, Bring Forth Justice. He's written One Blood, uh, a whole number of books. 
and it has had a profound impact on racial reconciliation. And then I brought our team down here to Phoenix to meet with Kit Danley at Neighborhood Ministries, where we ultimately ended up ministering. And Kit taught us God's heart for the poor through the scriptures and a number of things that uh, we didn't know. And so during those years as U.S. Director, we not only launched ministries, but we also um, were being taught and uh, mentored by people who, min who ministered in the urban context. Now, while I was leading, there were a number of other people around the world who were seeing God stir them in this same direction. So I was not the only one who was supporting ideas of ministry to the poor. Others were as well. And it was, uh, it was a, an encouraging time where it was very, very evident that not only when uh, I had said in Luke 4, the spirit of the Lord is upon me and has anointed me to preach the gospel of the poor. When Jesus had said that, I observed that there was a spirit work going on in the navigators. There was lots of resistance. Anytime you move to minister, to open your lives up to people of color and the poor, I promise you there will be opposition. There will be struggles. And, and we had it in the navigators. But since that time, uh, I have observed that the, the navigators have now have numerous ministries in Asia ministering among the poor. In Africa, we have a very, very rich and flourishing ministry in the rural populations of Africa. The U.S. has a lot of ministries in the urban context. I mentioned Breaking Ground and the I-58 ministry that is in the urban context and the urban poor. There's also Cincinnati, Grand Rapids, Detroit, New York, uh, Raleigh, Durham, Compton, Albuquerque, uh, and, um, uh, and um, also, um, well, Phoenix here in terms of where we are. So there are lots of urban ministries around the country and as I've already mentioned, Chicago. Also, the US navigators have launched this specific ministry of I-58 among the poor. It's a division of our ministry. And that ministry is focused on strictly on the urban poor in our urban poor context. Since the uh, about uh, 2006 or seven, the navigators had launched a study and focus on poverty, corruption, and injustice among the nations. And so this has been a concerted effort now since the early 2000s to move the navigators into a direction of ministering among the poor. And I am very, very excited about what God has done among us. But again, I want to emphasize there has been a lot of opposition, but it's very evident that God's hand is on this movement. In 2009, we moved to Phoenix. And uh, we moved right into the urban center, uh, Neighborhood Ministries, which is quite a well-developed ministry, is just three blocks from us. And uh, uh, we can walk over to the campus. We don't walk over there very often. We usually drive, but uh, it's a large ministry that uh, has multiple dimensions. We have what's a, called a kids club a massive kids club in the summer. Then we have Monday nights, we have a teen group, we have a church, we have a mom's place, we have a youth ministry, we have a ministry to unaccompanied minors. Oh, I could go on and on and on. And then we have uh, enterprises of which one of them is uh, the t-shirt shop that I started in 2012. But actually, when we moved here, I focused, along with Becky, on uh, ministering in, uh, Becky uh, ministered in the thrift store. I ministered among felons and uh, those who were former gang members. You can see their pictures there. And uh, also with mental health issues. 
the people you're looking at there other than Jay, the Caucasian person, the people you're looking at there, this is Alex and Selena Kanyez. This is Marcos Marquez. And this is, um, trying to think what his name is. Um, I'll think of it in a moment. Anyway, this was a, a, um, a team. This is uh, Darian and Oscar, sorry, this is Oscar. And Oscar had uh, been in prison. Marcos had been in prison. Selena had not, but Selena was, uh, in, uh, was had a, her first child when she was 14 years old. Her mother left her uh, in a park with her siblings when she was 11 years old. And uh, now her mother has come to Jesus, which is uh, just a wonderful thing to see. And they have been reunited. Alex was a gang le leader, as was Marcos. Both of them suffer with mental health issues. And uh, we've had a wonderful time ministering with these different people. And uh, now Alex and Selena use the, uh, our leaders of the uh, t-shirt shop. I found that when I got these guys involved in Bible study, the problem was they needed a holistic environment. To be, in, to be working with them just in Bible study and relating to them personally and not have them in a working context it became very, very evident that there was no way that they were going to be discipled. I'll never forget driving along with Marcos before I had actually started the t-shirt shop. And I'm going to use Marcos's words, so forgive me. But Marcos looked at me and he said, damn it, I don't need a discipler, I need a friend. Well, I became a mentor, a friend, and a boss. I can't tell you how difficult that was. But we launched the ministry uh, or the business in uh, 2012. That, uh, that uh, enterprise continues to this day. A number of people are in and out of that ministry where they work for a season and then they uh, get involved in, uh, in other places like Oscar now is driving heavy machinery. None of them have returned to prison. And a number of them have come to Jesus. And so they're all working and they're all taking care of their families. Alex and Selena have two lovely children and they now own their own home and uh, they are flourishing. And so if you want to, you can go to opportunities.com or go to the Neighborhood Ministries website. Just type in neighborhoodministries.com uh, or you can go to opportunities.com. And Selena tells her story. And she's a pretty exuberant lady. And the journey of her coming to Jesus is, is a very, very interesting one. And I still am very much involved with uh, Alex. Selena, and uh, um, to some degree, not to a great degree, but some degree with Marcos, and then the marketing director for, uh, for uh, opportunities. And I mentor them and have a Bible study with them. We also are involved with our neighbors. Uh, Patrick and his family is next door to us, right next door. Then we have Juan and Frankie across the street. We're not as close to them. Someone mentioned earlier, how do you minister to your neighbors? Becky and I have always ministered to our neighbors wherever we've been. But the interesting thing is it took on a whole new dimension for us here. We had to let down our defenses. We had to learn to trust our neighbors. But we've learned to minister to these people and uh, we've all become friends. None of them have come to the Lord, uh, but we're still here and we're trusting God to, uh, to move them along. And uh, we, we do talk about Jesus. It's a regular conversation. In fact, Patrick was over at my house even during COVID the other day and uh, we were talking and Patrick looked at me and he said, Alan, 
I just want you to know that people in this community, when they're ready, they will come. I think he was talking about himself, but he also knows my neighbors uh, better than I do. Then uh, I had a friend, Jeff Bowles, who was working with us at Opportunities. And when I stepped out of Opportunities, he stepped out of Opportunities. And he went into his own Creighton community and launched the Creighton Community Foundation. And so I not only work with the, uh, with, uh, with, uh, the people that we mentor, but also uh, we lead a Bible study with the leaders here. Not all of these leaders. I actually lead a Bible study with four of the leaders. I can't pick them out because of their mask. I know this is Frankie, and, uh, but I can't find the others. But anyway, this, they're in a food distribution uh, center that day. They do a lot of things. They have a wildlife group with the kids, a number of other things that they're doing in the community, building trust in it. And um, I get to mentor and uh, lead the Bible study. So it's quite, quite exciting. And then I didn't mention to you, we have four families that uh, we got involved with almost as soon as we got here. Almost all of them were destitute. And now today, those four families are beginning to show signs of flourishing. Some are doing better than others, but it has been quite a little journey to watch those families emerge and their children. And uh, we're just excited to have been a part of that as well. So I'm sitting here at uh, 77. I won't tell you how old Becky is, but she's younger than I am. And uh, we, uh, we're thankful for being a part of this. Eventually, we'll probably have to move back to Colorado Springs because we'll need to be close to family. But right now, we're here and, and we're flourishing. So that's the story of the journey. And it looks like we're right on time at 10 o'clock. So uh, if you uh, have some questions, go ahead and um, I'd be glad to field them or do whatever you need to do. Okay. Hi, Ellen, can you um can you stop sharing your screen so that people can see more people in Zoom? Okay. Um, and I also want to say that your story has been really inspiring. I, I mean, I'm just I, I heard it before when you were at our house for an outreach dinner once a couple years ago, and uh -huh. I heard it again it just makes me have tingles all over. It's a great story. Um. Can I ask the first question, which is, when you decided to leave uh, what was a pretty prestigious, you know, a prominent leadership role in a very well-known organization to pack up and actually, I assume you live in, in the neighborhood in which you work, with yes. people, right? So you're not moving to a nice suburb of Phoenix, you're, you're in the inner city of Phoenix. Um, what was the reaction of the people around you? And, and you know, did it, how, how did you feel? And how did they feel? Well, I'm writing a book called Mainstream to the Margins. And the first chapter is what I've just shared with you this morning, the journey in. Mm -hmm. But I thought because of my involvement in urban contexts and launching, uh, helping launch other urban ministries mm -hmm. and uh, having listened to John Perkins and Kit and others talk about the poor, I thought that we would make a pretty rapid adjust, adjustment. But that's not what happened. And so the second chapter is on what we went through uh, in adjustments. One was giving up efficiency and effectiveness and going for relationship. Another one was giving up distance. Uh, in other words, no walls, but letting the walls down distance and self-protection. A third learning area was giving up innocence. I actually thought I was coming, I'm here to help you. And that statement that Marcos made about not needing a discipler, but needing a friend, uh, he sensed that I was ministering to him like this. And we had to learn to move into our community and, and partner. I have a little book here called, uh, Friendships at the Margins, 
And uh, this is an excellent little book. And uh, they've done a great job of describing what it means to learn to minister in an urban or a, a difficult context. And so, yeah, it was quite an adjustment. And even now it's an adjustment. So that's probably as much as I can cover now. Um, and maybe this is leading to a follow-up question and then I'll stop hogging the questions. Uh, you mentioned that people have you know, uh, ministered and, and discipled you and mentored you as to what it means to work uh, among the urban poor. And you learned all this stuff. You, met, you just showed us that book. Um, are, if, are there other resources or websites or people that you would recommend if there are people at South Park Church who are interested in exploring a similar path? Um, not now, you know, off the top of your head, but maybe afterwards, if you could send me a slide with some of your recommendations. I can, but let me just mention, uh, I know that some in your church have dealt with this book by Tim Keller. Mm -hmm. uh, this is, this is, is 101 Basics. It's called Generous Justice. Okay. Uh, this is a very, very good book, and it's very foundational. And for those who struggle, uh, and a lot of evangelicals struggle with justice issues. And uh, in many instances, it's understandable. Uh, I have struggled. Uh, we've had to come a long ways in learning our way and navigating our way into understanding what's involved. And we've had to go through periods where we look at things and we've been challenged. In some places, we've said, yes, we need to change and learn. In other cases, we've said, no, we can't go there. And we're not going there. Uh, there is another book here that uh, I like by InterVarsity Press by Carl Ellis. It's actually written to the Black community. Uh, but Carl Ellis is at uh, Reform, Semin Reform Seminary in Tennessee. It's called Free at Last. It's, it's a very good book. And uh, he's a very sharp man and thoroughly biblical. And then I have another book here called Onward uh, by Russell Moore. He is the ethics director of the Southern Baptist Convention. And the Southern Baptist Convention is in the midst of tremendous turmoil right now. And uh, Russell Moore has been one of the steadying forces uh, in that, uh, that community. Another book that you might be interested in, this is World Relief, uh, mm -hmm. Welcoming Strangers. Okay, I've read that one. That's really good. And I'm sure the, uh, with South Park Church's involvement with World Relief, uh, it's, it's excellent. Now, let me also say that going on the website of the National Association of Evangelicals and going to the health of the nation, I've been involved. I used to serve on the board of the National Association of Evangelicals. And uh, I was in the early stages, I was involved in putting together their document on the health of the nation, but they have revised it and they've done a good job. And uh, again, there are things that will challenge those of us who sit in the pew, but these are <laughs> outstanding leaders who have thought these issues through carefully. And they have maintained uh, three things that uh, we are often concerned about when we get into this pro-life. They're all, everybody that I've shared with you are, are pro-life. Second thing is they are all advocating loving our LBGTQ plus uh, people in our, uh, and friends in our society. And I, I've got many right here in my own neighborhood that we, we connect with, but nevertheless, they have maintained their, um, their commitment to a biblical view. Some would debate whether it's biblical, but uh, I think the view is biblical and they've done a great job of navigating that. 
And then the third thing on religious liberty, they have maintained their stance on that. All of these people that I've recommended are in that category. So I'm saying to you that they're safe <coughs> and uh, they're good for a church like South Park in reviewing um, uh, these issues. Wow, well, thank you very much. And now I understand why the background behind you features so many books. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, so I, I do like reading. Yeah. Uh, now, please, anyone else, uh, unmute yourself and ask Alan questions. I have two questions. Um, the first is probably sounds stupid, but just curious. I even went online to try to find it. What does I-58 mean? Isaiah 58. Isaiah 58. Okay. Yeah. That's what I thought, but I want to make sure. And then yeah. the other question is in the Phoenix area, is there one um, mega <clears throat> church that helps support the ministries or is it just totally come from funding? Where, you know, where are the dollars um funding because it seems like it's, it's all over the city it's, it's all, all the over city? the city uh, there are two churches uh, open door fellowship uh neighborhood ministries emerged out of open door fellowship but open door fellowship is now north of, of this ministry they used to be one but now neighborhood ministries is here in the urban context and open door fellowship moves north Scottsdale Bible has been very involved with uh, neighborhood ministries over the years and, and many others. Okay. And just so you know, the reason I'm asking is I have a little place about a half hour from there that I'm looking to retire and looking to volunteer. So that's why I really wanted to listen today. Well, good. Uh, yeah. As they Sounds say, come, come on down. Yeah, well, I plan on it my next visit, um, which will be the end of April, 1st of May. Yeah. Um, I'm going to come check it out because okay. uh, that would be well, fun. We, we welcome you and uh, give us a call and we'll uh, integrate you. Good. Okay. In terms of volunteering, uh, also, there are some opportunities with Creighton Community Foundation as well, which is... Uh, quite, I don't know, maybe uh, five or six miles from here okay. uh, toward the east on I-10. Any, anybody else with questions? If no one else is, I have her. Alan, it's clear that you, you, you talked more about your call to serve the poor. But when did you decide that you were going to uh, spend your life serving the Lord? And how did college prepare you for that? Did you ever have a secular job or did you use college as a means to do that? It'd be interesting your, your path was there. Well, I was involved with the Navigators from 1964 to uh, 1970, but I taught school, uh, taught world history. And also I had to get a job teaching sixth grade for a couple of years. And um, uh, so I was a teacher and, uh, but uh, it's quite a dramatic story in terms of how God called us to minister uh, with the navigators. And I am so grateful to the navigators for all the years of being able to serve with them. Um, I love serving on the board, but um, I, yeah, it would the long, the short story of it is that I was out arguing with the banker about commitment to church. And uh, also, I was questioning whether uh, the navigators were too independent from the church. And that morning I had, I was on my bed reading my Bible and I had my Bible on the pillow and I was reading Hebrews six. And uh, I didn't take my Bible with me that day. And I, when I got back from arguing with the banker, 
all day. <laughs> I walked to the kitchen door of our third floor attic apartment and I looked at Becky and I said, I hate the navigators. <laughs> and uh, I don't want anything to do with them. And Becky looked at me and said, okay. And then I went back around to my bed and just kind of flopped down on the bed and in anger started reading Hebrews 6. And I got to verse 11, and it says, Be not slothful, but be followers of, of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. And Brad that day had talked to me about saying, Alan, what you need to do is you need to plug in with that stream of people. And he wasn't discounting churches in this case, but he said, you need to safely plug in with people who are people of the promise, Abraham's promise. In you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And then in verse 14, it said, saying, I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply you. And spiritual multiplication was right at the heart of the navigator call. Being a discipler <clears throat> a maker of disciple makers. And I looked at it and it was as if that verse had come right out of the Bible. And it was right in context with what I was doing. It was in context of my devotional life. And I looked at it and I knew that was God's call. And so I got up and walked to the kitchen door and looked at Becky and said, guess what? I think maybe God is calling us to serve with the navigators. <laughs> and she looked at me and said, okay. <laughs> and so 50 years later, we're here. She didn't say make up your mind. <laughs> no, she, she, was, uh, she was just happy to do what God wanted. Wow. By the way, there's another story uh, here that Becky played a tremendous part in. Before we moved to uh, Phoenix, uh, we were kind of in tension trying to figure out what are we going to do and should we keep our house in Colorado Springs? Should we go only go for six months at a time? What should we do? And um, so finally, we agreed that we would not talk about it anymore. And for one month, we would just pray about it. And then at the end of that month, we would sit down and talk. So the day came and we went back out on our back deck that looks out over beautiful Colorado Springs and up to Pikes Peak. And I said to Becky, I said, so what is God saying to you? And she said, we need to sell everything, leave it all and go to Phoenix because if we don't, we will want to come back. Mm. Well, we sold everything and we did want to go back. <laughs> this, this has not been an easy journey. This has been a difficult journey. It's been a wonderful journey, but it has been very, very painful because I came in here thinking that we, I, we knew pretty much what to do. And we almost had to start over and reclaim the foundations of what we were called to but at the same time, we had to learn how to minister in the urban context. And we're still learning. Mm -hmm. Can I ask a follow-up question to that? I know that some of us have been, um, uh, when we were talking to Michael Allen about Together Chicago, um, some people were saying it looks really interesting, some of the volunteer opportunities. But they said, I'm a little nervous about going into some of these neighborhoods. You know, Park Ridge is is very white, very safe, um, no parallel parking required. Uh, and, you know, just, you feel you, like you feel like you walk outside and take a walk like at midnight and you don't feel unsafe. What was it like for you moving in, into and actually living in a neighborhood like where you are now? Well, we have a lot of things that go on in our neighborhood. Uh, we've had murders. Uh, in our back alley when we were in here for six, uh, within six months, a homeless guy 
was shot by a Lando. And he later, the homeless guy died. Um, and by the way, the homeless guy got, or the landowner got away with it, which was tragic. He should have never gotten away with what he, he had done. That homeless guy could have never hurt him. And uh, so it was, it was sad. But just to give you the journey, we started uh, the night we moved into our house. I had a remote and we had an alarm on the house and we had a remote button that if you pressed it, it would go straight to the police. And I told Becky, I said, now, honey, you will be safe here. You can just press that and the police will be right here. Well, I can assure you that was not true. Uh, if they would show up two or three hours later, it might be possible, but they would not have been here. But now let's fast forward. My friend Keith asked, came over to my house. Now Keith is involved in all kinds of things. He was living with his grandmother. His grandmother was a believer. But Keith's been involved in a lot of things, and he struggled with a lot of things. His grandmother was 98 when she died, and I get a knock on my door one morning, and Keith says, Alan, my grandmother died. Would you come to my grandmother's funeral? Now, I was the only one in the neighborhood who was there. Guess what? That Baptist church was jam-packed from people all over the country. And his mother knew all kinds of people, and she had done some, his grandmother had done some amazing things. And Keith was saying to me, Alan, you're my friend. Would you come? So then Patrick came to me a little bit later. And Patrick said to me, and Patrick's a big man, a big, big black man, probably 6'5", six, 6'6". Six, six. And he looked at me and he said, Alan, I just want you to know that I have spoken to the neighbors and we've got your back. And then one day I get a knock on my door and it's Keith. And Keith said to me, Alan, you left your trunk lid up and I closed it. I just want you to know we've got your back. So now we're friends. I mean, we are friends. They haven't come to Jesus, but we are friends. And I think I can show you something here that is just fascinating. Everybody in my community will pray. If you ask them to pray, if you want to pray for them, they'll take it in a heartbeat. See this sheet right here? Okay, now that's Patrick and Karina's children. And Patrick came over and handed me this sheet for his two boys and two girls and said, I want you to pray for them. So it's a whole different world. And before we moved in here, my son-in-law was told by a Denver police detective, your parents need to have a psychological exam for moving into that neighborhood. Now I knew enough about the neighborhood that I didn't think that was necessary. But he said, they have no idea of what they're involved in. Now, I know what goes on in this community. It is a very fragile community. But you know what? We moved in here, and we didn't need a psychological exam. We love our neighbors. There are problems. But it's not nearly as dangerous as what a lot of people say. Uh, so uh, God can take care of you. Thank you. <clears throat> Yeah, that's the other thing. Like Becky just said, and the neighborhood has improved. Neighborhood Ministries has had a profound impact. Other things have happened as well that have improved the neighborhood. 
but this is not this is not uh, a gang infested neighborhood. It it was gangs are still here, but right now this community is what I would call a fragile community. Mm -hmm. And also the homes around us have improved greatly. If you drove in here and looked at our neighborhood right now, you would look at it and the first thing you would say is that's not so bad. Now it was bad when we got here, but homes have been renovated. Families have owned their homes and uh, you, you don't ever want to forget that things can go wrong here in a hurry. But uh, at this, like uh, Kit Danley's son made the comment, they asked him if he was afraid, and he said, Afraid, no. Aware, yes. Mm -hmm. So you don't ever want to walk into an urban area without taking proper precautions. But I'll tell you what, it's not nearly as dangerous as it, as it seems. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? This is Judy. I just want to thank Alan so much for his time today and sharing his story um, and his journey. Um, I am so touched and inspired um, by your story and the way that the Lord has called you and you heard him and you listened and you waited and I, I thought that was amazing how you said, you know, like when the, the image of seeing the lady in the river um, washing the baby um, is just so profound. Just, um, I, could, I can see it just in front of my eyes from how you described it. And um, I just feel very, very touched um, that, you know, to see God working through you um, and putting you there um, to do his work. And I'm just so uh, grateful to know you and to hear you speak today. And um, I thank you. you. You've given me so much to think about. Well, thank you, Judy. And uh, I'm, I'm delighted to hear that. Um, I know we've run over, so if anyone wants to drop off, that's fine. And that actually includes you, Alan, if you and Becky need to go somewhere. Um, otherwise, you're welcome to stay and talk. Frank is going to stop the recording now, I think. No, I'm going to stop it. Yeah. I actually uh, have a question. Oh, it, okay. But, you know, people, you know, and I understand it's 1225 now. You had mentioned, Alan, that any time that you want to help the poor, there's opposition. Do you have any idea of why is there opposition? How do you deal with that opposition? Uh, it's just kind of surprising that a Christian organization would have opposition to helping the poor. Great question, Frank. Well, one thing you have to start out with is you have to understand that the scriptures are very, very, very strong on God's heart for the poor. Uh, it, it works uh, something like this. Uh, this is the way I describe it anyway. Is Genesis 12, you have God who is moving through history to bless the nations and call out a people for himself out of the nations. And so you have the history of the people of God and people coming into faith. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. And without the cross, you can't enter in. But as you move through history, God, it's as though he looks and has a plumb line that he runs right down through the people of God. And the question is, is how did you treat the most vulnerable? And especially in America today, we as evangelicals, have gotten separated from the poor. And so what we have, we have become very self-satisfied with what we have, and we become people who try to protect what we have. And what we're trying to protect is good. 
I uh, like talking about these three things, pro-life, uh, marriage, uh, the issues of religious liberty. There is nothing wrong with that. That is important. But we have to see that God sees that we are salt and light in the world. And we have to see that our credibility in the world is absolutely critical as God's people and his hands and feet in this world. And if God's people are ever to be shown to having not loved the poor and having not cared <coughs> for people who are different from us, we're in deep trouble. And sometimes that elicits in people when we start to move up to, for example, uh, Mark Knoll says in his book on the Civil War during before the antebellum period, he says one of the problems with slavery was that there was no voice that ever got control of the narrative. So you had the abolitionists and you had those who were for slavery. And those who were committed to slavery were saying, we believe in an inerrant Bible, and we can prove to you that the Bible says that slavery is okay. And they built a whole theology on that. And Mark Knoll says nobody could get control of the narrative because the emotions were so high. We're in a period like that right now. And let me get uh, maybe a little prophetic small p. If the church does not find a way to step into this thing and to bring about love and reconciliation, both the left and the right are so polarized that there is potential literally in this country for civil war. If you ask someone in the antebellum period, in the 1850s, are we headed for a civil war? They would say, well, potentially. But there are things going on in this country right now that are so scary on both sides that if the church doesn't stand up and doesn't take this and move with it into a reconciling posture and humbly go with our brothers and sisters together, we could be thrown into a period of time that is uh, very, very difficult. Now, I hate to say that. I, I really regret to say that. I, I grieve over saying that, but I'm saying this is a very, very, very difficult time. And uh, the people of God hold it in their hands to do something about this. But uh, right now, I don't see it because we're so polarized. And so in any community, any community that we go into, polarization, is there. And so if you have a strong push toward uh, helping our brothers and sisters of color, there will be reaction. And uh, there are other issues. Uh, I have some deep concerns about how the left is approaching justice issues. I have real deep concerns. But I also know that justice is an issue in this country. And so the question is, is will the church step up and take a sane, sensible course of direction, or will we get sucked into either side? Hmm. Wow. Um, I feel, and actually Frank prompted me, <laughs> um, can we pray for you? and? Um, pray to, to um, about some of these issues right now? Would that be okay if I pray for, for you? That would be fine. Thank you. I, I, I just had a question, Dorothy. I'm so sorry. No, it's fine. I, uh, one, 
One burning question for Alan is, have you decided on the name for your book yet? Yes. What is it? Mainstream to the margins. Mainstream to the margin. Not right. mainstreams, but mainstream to the margins. I lived from really 1964 when I met the navigators, I was in the mainstream yeah. right on up to 1993. I was in the mainstream and then I was in the mainstream even when I was leading the navigators. And uh, we decided that we were going to go to the margins <laughs> after I stepped out. And um, But I have five chapters done and I get writer's cramp. And um, then I learn something new and I go back and correct it. And so uh, <laughs> uh, it, it may be three, two or three years from now, you might see the full book. I don't know. <laughs> well, I'll be praying for you and I look forward to it. Okay, thank you, Judy. Okay, okay any other questions? Yeah. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for the privilege and the opportunity to hear Becky and Alan's story. And Lord, we ask that you would use this story to teach us something as well. That this isn't just something that we would listen to and think, oh, that's interesting, and then just go back to our um, life and it makes no impression at all. But Lord, I ask that your Holy Spirit would use Alan's words to sink into our hearts the way some of the things that people in his life, the banker, and some of these verses from um, Isaiah and from Luke have spoken to him. Sometimes it took years, Lord, but I pray that some of the things that he's teaching us would sink into our hearts and that we would remember that faith without works is dead and that we need to put hands and feet to our faith and turn it into reality and that your blessings are not just for us to hoard to ourselves, but that you have always intended for us to be a conduit for your blessings to flow into the world, that you've called us to be light and salt. So Lord, I ask that you would teach South Park Church these lessons and give us wisdom and discernment and humility and listening hearts to discern the next steps that we should take both individually and as a church. And that we would use um, the story that Alan and Becky have told us to guide our thinking and, and to, what, to challenge us uh, as to what we should do next. And so Lord, we pray your blessing on him and on all the ministries they're involved with, on the neighborhood that they're in, on his neighbors who do not know you yet, but who love and, and have befriended them. And we ask your blessing on everything you are doing in the world. And we know that you love the poor and we ask your special blessing on them and on what we can learn from them, not just what we can do for them, but what we can learn from them as we work together. And we pray this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you so Thank much, you. Alan. And please do um, send me an email with some of these resources and books so that um, we will post it on the South Park Church website along okay, with Okay, will do. And Gretchen, we look forward to seeing you. Yeah. So I'm going to stop. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you bye -bye. very much.